can start to support your team and yourself through constant changing situations. So we will look, first of all, at trust. So trust plays a really big part in this. And then how can we help ourselves and team members move through those stages of change and use trust as our guide? So trust is really interesting and there's been a lot of work around it. And one of the things that I found quite incredible was that we can actually measure trust. And there's a trust equation. Some of you may have seen this before or a trust formula that helps us to be able to better navigate change, but also decide who and or, or how much we trust somebody or who we want to follow. So if I'm an employee or a team member, who do I want to follow? And I'm going to subconsciously probably rate them across some certain areas. And then that's going to determine whether I trust them and want to follow them. So let's have a look at this trust formula. Before we do, I want to share with you a, a, a really powerful quote from Ray Dalio. So for those who don't know, Ray Dalio is the founder of Bridgewater. And this is one of the world's largest hedge funds. I don't think he works there anymore, but he founded it. His quote is pain, so discomfort, change, uncertainty, plus reflection, self-awareness, self looking inside what's going on for me and how it's affecting me. So discernment, personal discernment. So pain plus reflection equals progress. But there was a little slight caveat in that. He said that reflection that you have needs to be in a trustworthy culture or with somebody you trust. So what he did in his organisation is they would have regular team meetings and catch ups with peers and bosses and all across all across the lines up and down diagonal and they had a safe space to reflect and they weren't judged on their downfalls or their inadequacies or their weaknesses they used it as a point of reflection to be able to grow and increase mental complexity so his business became very innovative and very successful because he build, he had the foundations for people to experience uncertainty, change, um, challenge, risk, whatever that pain was, that pain point, but to really safely reflect on it and admit to and be vulnerable uh, and then progress because now I can progress because I've had the challenge I can see the change. I can see how it's going to affect me. I've got people around me, a tribe around me that support me and will challenge me and will hear me out without judgment. That allows me to safely progress. So what does a trusted environment look like? What does trust look like? And as I said, it's something that we can measure. So let's have a look at the trust equation. So the trust equation is made up of four parts. And you can measure this and I encourage you if you're leading a team to potentially get some feedback from your team to see how much they trust you. Alternatively, you could run this equation for people that you are involved with or that you lead to see how much you actually trust them. So it's really simple. The first part of the equation is credibility. So the person that I'm looking at or potentially the organization that I'm looking at? Are they credible? Do they know what they're talking about? Do they have experience? Do they have knowledge? What do they have that proves that they're credible in what they're saying? So earlier today, uh, Carolina read out my bio. That's all well and good. A lot of fancy words, everyone has bios. But am I credible? Do I actually have everything that it says in that bio. Have I really done those things? Can I prove it? So how credible am I? Then the next, the next part of the equation is reliability. So how reliable am I? So how reliable are you to the people that you're leading? Or if you're measuring somebody else, how reliable are they? Then the third part is empathy. So we will trust people when they're credible. We'll trust people when they're reliable. We'll trust people when they empathize with us and they get us. Now, empathy 
can really only occur when you know yourself and you understand how you work. So we've gone through how the mind works today. We've understood that. We've gone through mental complexity and the stages of change. So if you really understand those frameworks have gone through today, you can now empathize with people because you know what stage of development they're in. You know the mindset that they have is unique to themselves based on their upbringing, their culture, their parenting, their schooling. And you also know that they're going to be at a certain level in the, in the cycle of change. So now you can empathize. Instead of judging them for where they're at or their lack of progress, you can now empathize with them through knowledge, but also through potentially you've gone through something similar yourself. So what we do is we add those things together. And let's say hypothetically, we gave each one of those a score out of five. So how credible is someone? Five would be really credible. Zero would be not credible at all. And then you'd say, okay, five for credibility, four for reliability, three for empathy. So that starts to give you a bit of an understanding. You can actually put numbers to this. But then we need to divide it by their self-orientation. So self-orientation would mean, are they in it for themselves? Or are they in this, whatever it is, for the greater good? Do they see the greater good of everyone? And so we can start to form our judgments on that. And again, we may rate them out of five. But this time, the higher the score, the worse it is. So is somebody really, really, really selfish? We'll give them a five. But if someone is more aligned to the greater good, a little bit more altruistic, altruistic, then we might give them a, a one. Now, if you were to add up those scores, the top scores and divide, uh, divide them by the self-orientation, you end up with a trust score. And so the ideal trust score would be 15, which would be five plus five plus five divided by one. 15 divided by one is 15. So my challenge to you is if you do lead or manage people to send out an email and ask them to rate you on those things to give you a score out of five and then you can work out your trust score. So this is also another way to build a trusting environment. So if you imagine if your whole team had, you know, high levels of credibility, reliability, empathy and low levels of self-orientation, now we're building a team and a culture of trust. So if we look at the, the change cycle, which now I'm calling the fear cycle, because really change does instill fear within us. Because what happens is we have this idea or this thing that's going to happen that we've never experienced before. The brain goes, I have no cells of recognition. So therefore I'm going to start to send out the stress response which then makes you feel a little bit of fear, worry, doubt, anxiety. So how do we help people navigate through this? So the first thing is, we know that they're gonna go from pre-contemplation to contemplation to preparation, and then highly likely between preparation and action, they're going to experience fear. The, I'm about to step out and do something different, but my subconscious wants to pull me back to the comfort. Generally, this occurs because of a lack of trust, a lack of trust in the leader that is going to support them and keep them safe in the unknown, but also it's from unawareness or ignorance. They're not aware that they can change the program. They don't know that it's an internal uh, mechanism that is actually keeping them in the old and wanting them to stay where things have always been comfortable and familiar and known. So how do we help them? How do we help them navigate that fear? Or how do you navigate the fear yourself? First of all, we need to build trust. So again, if you're a leader, are you credible? Are you reliable? Are you showing empathy? Have you got, um, 
low self-orientation because people will trust you and they'll want to come on the journey with you. So trust is one thing that gets you there. The other is knowledge. Knowledge happens with what's the vision? What's the plan? Knowledge of who I am, how I operate, my current strengths. Knowledge of the potential I have within me. Knowledge that my mind is going to keep me back and it's going to help me, it's going to make me feel anxious. Do I use anxiety as something that holds me back because I'm unaware of it and keeps me and takes me back to contemplation? Or do I use anxiety as a trigger and change it into excitement because I'm about to grow? It's just changing your perception. That's higher levels of mental complexity. So now we can start to see how stages of adult development are really important in navigating uncertainty and fear and change. The more you know about yourself, the more you know about your biology, the more you know about your psychology, the better placed you are to manage whatever life throws at you. Whatever, whether it be an organization that makes you change or whether it be a pandemic that makes you change or whether it be a change you're creating yourself because you have a vision or a goal. It's the same for everyone. A lot of people constantly, let me just get my mouse up, will go around in circles here. They keep, oh no, this will be people that have goals and you probably see this happen. They, they sit here for a while feeling a little stuck in bondage in a cage somewhere and then they'll have an idea, whoops, they'll have an idea about, oh, I could start a business or I might start exercising or I'm going to change the way I eat or whatever it might be. They, they have this idea and they start contemplating what would happen if they made some changes. Then they might start preparing for it and then they think I'm going to take action and the cybernetic system and the um, immunity to change kick in and they go back to here. They don't step through. And then they have another idea. And they go, oh, they might get to here and they might just take a little bit of action and have a false start. But because they're not aware of what's happening internally, they go back to here and they start again. And they just have cycles of going around, hitting the fear, hitting this thin veil of uncertainty, this thin barrier. We want them to go across and over the, over the horizon, over the pale. And the way that we get there is through trust and through knowledge and education and study and self-awareness. So how can you build that within your people and within yourself? It's the greatest gift you can give your team members or yourself is understanding this, this vehicle that you're traveling your life in. Based on what we know now, what are some things, some direct things you can do to help them to move through where they are from preparation or potentially feeling stuck to feeling the anxiety and the uncertainty to then moving into taking the action that's required? Um, I was just thinking as, as far as managing like people and teams and things, all we can really do is control the environment in which they, they can either flourish or, or not. Um, but as for individuals, I think navigating your own fear um, is walking the talk, so to speak. You have to put in place all of your strategies and then you have to actually execute them instead of allowing um, your negative self-consciousness to, to block that. Yeah, absolutely. And it becomes a skill and it happens with practice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when I was aware that these, this anxiety that I felt was purely, a, was purely a sign that I was about to grow, I flipped how I looked at it. And it enabled me to see this as, oh, this is growth. This is nothing to be afraid of. And one of the things that I talk about in a lot of my um, live events is we talk about appropriate fear and inappropriate fear. And if we can start to distinguish that ourselves, we can help other people distinguish, distinguish as well. So appropriate fear would be 
my life is in immediate danger right now. That's appropriate fear. You know, I'm standing in the middle of a freeway and there's cars everywhere. You know, my life is in danger. I'm at the edge of a cliff and it's windy and I could get blown off and there's no security rails. That fear is appropriate. 100%. That is what the fear response or the stress response is designed for. However, over time, we've started to become, I'm even going to use the word addicted to inappropriate fear. Whereas, oh, I wonder what people will think. Oh, I might make a mistake. I might look stupid. And that's the immunity to change kicking in. That's inappropriate fear. It's preventing us from growth. So if we can notice the signals within our body, that anxiety that we feel, that fear that we feel and go, is my life actually in danger? No, this is inappropriate. I must be about to grow. I'm about to move out of the known of my world into the unknown. It's a completely different narrative. And if you can become aware of that, you move up to self-transforming. That's a different perspective. That's being able to see something from a different, a higher point of view. I can now see that my life's not in danger. A lot of people feel the anxiety. And when we feel anxiety, the body wants to be safe and it shuts us down. If we feel it long enough, we end up with depression. Now that, unfortunately, anxiety and depression comes from ignorance. Ignorance of knowing what's actually happening within the body. So you, you can use these things, these tools with knowledge, you get to notice it and step forward anyway. So how do you help your team understand what's going on? First of all, I have to come over this fear first before I can impart this to my team. So mm -hmm. that's the main challenge actually, Yeah. to overcome this negative fear. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So there are some really good tools to help you personally navigate that. Um, for, for you, in it, for this particular instance, I would get you just to write out a sentence and finish it with the first thing that comes to mind for you. So something along the lines of, um, right now I'm really afraid because, and then just finish the sentence with whatever comes up. Then sit with whatever, that, whatever you finish that sentence with Sit with it and now move up into your conscious mind, draw on your imagination, draw on your reasoning ability, draw on your memory, draw on all your mental faculties to intelligently look at it from a different perspective. What would be the benefits of you overcoming that fear that you've identified? How could you navigate it? Because we don't give ourselves enough credit to our own resourcefulness. And if you look at it logically, you're going to see that you've created the fear with your own belief systems. Therefore, you can recreate it, rewrite it. You can self-author your way out of it. So communication. So for those of you who deal with teams, when you're about to navigate change and anxiety, they're going to look to you as a trusted source of information. There's that word trust again. So trust is really important. So what they're going to do is they're going to look to you for communication. So when uncertain times or change is happening in an organisation or externally, like what we're experiencing right now, your communication needs to help team members to not only feel safe, but to be safe. So this now is showing a level of empathy. I understand where you're at. I want you to feel safe and I want you to be safe. So that becomes one of the, the first things we start to look at to communicate. We want to also help them. The communication needs to help them adapt and cope. So we need to give them that information. How can you give them information and communicate that helps them cope with whatever's going on? How can you help them adapt? So what can you give them? And the next thing, the third point is, how can you create context and meaning? So if we think about change and the process of change and the elements that we need to have in there as somebody who is leading a team, 
the meaning is that emotional attachment. Give me context of why this needs to happen, but also give me an emotional reason. So now we're getting the conscious mind with context and we're getting the emotional subconscious mind, the feeling part of us with meaning. If we do that right, we now have alignment. More than likely to take the action. We're aligning conscious with subconscious and when they're aligned, we will naturally take the action more easily take the action because the analytical mind which sits in the middle is looking down and going yeah i can see this this feels right i can see now it makes sense why we need to do this i'll give permission for this to filter through to the subconscious now we will take the action so these are the key points that you need to communicate during these times of uncertainty and change So some of the things, if you are communicating, whether it be, I'm not going to tell you and give you scripts and say you need to the best practices of video conference or a town hall or an email or a personal phone call. You might find it's all of the above and you might find it's different for different people. If you know your team well enough, you'll know what they need. So first step, be honest. Be really honest, not only about what the change is, but what you know about the change, what information you are privy to. If you don't know about something, be honest. The immunity to change won't like that because the immunity to change or even the fixed mindset wants us to look smart. It's not about looking smart. It's about helping people navigate change. So be honest about the situation and what you know and what you don't know. Because now we're creating credibility. So we spoke a little earlier about cognitive overload. So try to avoid that. So cognitive overload is when we get too much information at once. And I have to say today, I'm giving you quite a number of frameworks and we're going off on a few um, diverging here and there, you may end up with mental fatigue at the end of today. You may end up with a little bit of cognitive overload. I'm apologizing right now, it wasn't my intent. However, what you need to do is look at what information you're giving somebody. And basically cognitive overload, what we've discovered through research and science is that anywhere between five to seven bits of information at a time is all we can cope with. Now, here's the important thing. You may not be giving five to seven pieces of information in one email or one delivery. You might put five in there, but think about what other information is they're being given from a stimulus around them. If they're watching the news, if they've got other team members that are talking about the change, if there's other things going in, they're getting information. So therefore, you want to keep yours quite clear to the point and just a little bit more frequent. So we'll take the pandemic as an example. There is a lot of information everywhere. Put on social media, turn on the television, turn on the radio. That's all anyone's talking about. So if you were to send out a email that was you know, really everything that you think that everyone needs, they're going to look at it and their brain's going to go, I can't read this right now. I've got too much going on and they won't take it in. Cognitive overload. So that's why it might mean smaller amounts, more to the point, but just a little bit more frequently. So when they get it, they can digest it. Because we sometimes think we've got to give everyone all this information. But all we're doing is we're feeding and filling them up to burn out too much. It'll end up in some form of mental, mental discourse or mental disintegration because it's just too much. We're burning people out. So we feel like we're giving them everything they need. But at the end, we're actually taking from them taking energy and resources. So when you're communicating, also 
ensure that you're starting to strengthen bonds with people as well. So start to really empathize with them when you're doing that and strengthen the bonds with the people you have. So where you can, make it personal. And if you are changing goals, which is likely to happen with uncertainty and change, is ensure that you're clearly stating what they are, but as I said earlier, create meaning in the message. Why are we doing this? What's the link to our greater purpose and our greater vision? Is our goal and our vision changing? If so, why? And how does that fit in with the work or the role I'm doing in my function or my team? So you might find that you're part of a conduit that comes down from a higher end in an organization. You may need to get that information and then look at it over with a different lens for how it actually relates to your team. And then send something on that shows them the purpose and the meaning behind it for the function and the, the objectives that your team has. So I mentioned earlier the Stockdale paradox. Vice Admiral James Stockdale, he was a um, prisoner of war in the Vietnam War. And he ended up, you know, having a, a, very, a very long life and a very successful life after, you know, coming out of the war. But what he, um, one of the things he kept getting asked afterwards was, you know, he said, which people survived in the war? Was it the was it the pessimists or the optimists? And everyone thinks he's going to say, yeah, the optimists survived. What his um, sort of principle is that creates a bit of a paradox is that when asked that question, he said, the pessimists didn't survive. They didn't last long because they just thought the world was over. So therefore they had no energy. They had no, no reason to live. So they gave up. But the optimists, they also didn't survive. Because what they were doing, they were being optimistic in a very defined way. They were saying, we'll be out by Easter. We'll be out by Christmas. But then Easter and Christmas would come and they'd still be there. And then they'd end up losing hope and giving up. So one of the things he said, and this is something that's been really important, especially right now, the times that we find ourselves in right now, is that he says, we need to remain short-term realistic. So that means thinking about what's happening right here, right now, for myself personally, for my team. What is it and what contingencies can I put in place now for the current situation? So think of him in a, you know, a prisoner of war camp. What is important right here, right now for us to survive? Let's do those things, contingencies for now. However, he had long-term optimism, not we'll be out by Christmas. He said, he said, we'll get through this. I know we'll get through this. Never put a time limit on it. It's going to be okay. We'll get through this. So people with a longer-term optimism, but short-term realism made it through. So it seems a little bit paradoxical because we're sort of being realistic right now and we're not being optimistic about the future. We're just being really long-term vision because that gives us an, an element of hope, but no date to it. When you're approaching your own life, when you're approaching um, working with teams, as a manager or a leader, this is a really powerful approach to take because they can see that you're being realistic you're not being Pollyanna, saying, we'll get through this. You're saying, okay, this is what's happened right now. Our business is closed down or we've got less work. Uh, here's some contingencies or let's work on some contingencies together. But let's also keep in mind that we're going to get through this and we can get through it together. And that's how he survived. That's how um, Stockdale, James Stockdale, ended up surviving because he just kept at it. Short-term realism, long-term optimism. You can do it with anything. Where am I right now with what's going on? What contingencies can I put in place? But I can also start to have optimism around the future, knowing that anything can happen. 
It won't always be the way it is now. And I get a say in that.